Lord, you are a fountain of life, restorer of my soul. I worship you today. Lord, you are the fountain of life, restorer of my soul. I worship you today. Lord, you are. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the Fountain of Life podcast. This is your host, Charles Zuta. For the past couple of almost a month now, we have been looking at the cross, God's eternal message of love for humanity. We've seen various facets of the cross, and as we draw this series to a close, I want to go back to the very beginning to look at the material needs of humanity. You see, when man fell, one of the things that God did was to curse the ground and to curse the efforts that man is going to put in to sustain himself. So it's very, very important, as we have seen, how Jesus' sacrifice dealt with our sin, our rejection, and all the other spiritual aspects of our lives, emotional aspects of our lives, to also look at our very being, our very existence as human beings. So for today, we are going to look at how Jesus took our poverty, how he took our cases, how he took our sicknesses, and that will draw the curtain on this series. It's not that that is all that we can say about salvation, but at least for now, we have enough to go out with and work to improve our lives and to find meaning and purpose for our lives. So we'll go back to Genesis chapter 3 and in the verse 17 downwards, this is what the Bible says. Then to Adam, he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. That was a very, very powerful curse God both, you know, pronounced on humanity. That is our forebear Adam. And it has passed on to us. So there is something that limits us. There are things that prevent us from excelling, prevent us from fulfilling the best that we can be as people. There are barriers, there are all sorts of things that stand in our way. And it has been that way since the fall. So today we want to look at how Jesus took away our poverty. Because in the strict sense of this, there is no way you are going to excel to your best or your maximum with this hanging around your neck. He said emphatically, from the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. So there are barriers, there are things. It's like we are on you know, a, a, a hamster wheel. We're spinning our wheel just to keep body and soul together. And it has been that way with the four. Imagine how life as God envisaged it in the garden with all his resources and all his abundance. But today the good news is that Jesus on the cross took away the poverty, the poverty that this brings on humanity, the lack and insufficiency, and always crying out in need for one area or the other. There's nobody on this planet who has all that they need because of this. However rich you are, there are areas in your life that you can consider as poor. So there is poverty, both materially spiritually, emotionally, that is hanging over us. I want to focus today on the poverty of material lack, 
that we experience. The question is, a lot of people don't believe that God is interested in giving us material success or giving us abundance of anything. And we have equated poverty for holiness and righteousness. But the truth is that if we choose poverty, that is our choice. But God took poverty away from us in Jesus Christ. So poverty is a choice in a lot of ways. But if we decide that this is what we want, then we can use the grace that God abounds or God creates for us to break the yoke of poverty and release the abundance that is in God. Lack of truth and lack of knowledge can deprive us and keep us in the yoke of poverty. But once we know, we are empowered to be able to break the yoke and the cycle of poverty. So let's go to what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, no, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and the verse 9 to lead us into how Jesus broke the yoke of poverty of humanity. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. So that settles the argument. It is God's wish, it's God's desire that we might become rich. Whether we embrace it and pursue it and walk in it, that is up to us. But from God's perspective, when his son died, he gave us grace. Grace is unmerited favor. We don't deserve it. That is true. We deserve judgment. We deserve to be deprived. We deserve insufficiency and lack. That is what we brought on ourselves by virtue of embracing sin and the lie of the devil. But God in his mercy took that lack and poverty, placed it on Jesus Christ so that we can receive the abundance that he has. And it is grace. Grace is we receiving what we don't deserve. And that is what Jesus did. So it's up to us to embrace that fact and then go out and translate that grace into abundance in our lives. So it says, for our sake, Jesus was rich, but for our sake he became poor, that we through his poverty might become rich. So the question is, when did he become rich? How we know he walked on the streets of gold, he owned everything. Everything that was made was for him. That is who he is, he's rich. Everything. And he demonstrated it what? here on earth. But when was he poor? That is a question we'll have to address. When was Jesus poor? How did he make himself poor so that we can have abundance? Certainly, it is not during the time of his earthly ministry. That might surprise you. Because whenever they had a lack, God provided. There were people who followed them and ministered unto them. For instance, when the tax collectors came, he sent Peter to just go catch a fish, took a coin out of his mouth, paid whatever they were due. And Judas kept the money back, so they had money. So in a lot of ways, they really were not living a life of poverty. They were not poor in the sense as we know poverty in our world today. If you go to Luke chapter 22, Luke 22 and the verse 35, he said, When I sent you without money bag, knapsack and sandals, did you lack anything? So they said nothing. So he sent the disciples, I told them, don't take any money, don't take knapsack, don't take sandals, don't take anything. And when they went, he asked them, Do you, did you lack anything? And they said nothing. They lacked nothing. So this is his public ministry. They lacked nothing. And Judas kept the money back. So they must have enough money to give to the poor as well. So in his earthly ministry, he wasn't poor. They had sufficiency. He multiplied bread. Five loaves and three fishes. They took 12 surplus baskets. That's plenty. 
You see, he did it twice. Seven and three fishes, you know, they took seven baskets. So in all his earthly ministry, those three years as he ministered prior to going to the cross, Jesus had abundance. They had everything. They, they had sufficiency enough to give away. So it is not a truth when we are told that, you know, we should look at Jesus because, you know, he, 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 he lived a life of poverty. No, he didn't. They were not poor. They had enough to live off and to spare. In John chapter 13 and the verse 29, this is what the Bible says. For some thought, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So Judas had a money box, money bag. They, they had enough money to do arms, to give to the poor, to pay the tithes, to buy the things that they needed. So when did he really become poor? As Paul is writing, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might become rich. So God is not shy to talk about wealth. He's not shy to talk about riches. So if Jesus made himself poor for our sake, then it must mean a lot to God that we become rich. It must mean a lot to God that we take advantage of the grace that he has given us in Jesus to elevate ourselves from the limitations of what was placed on Adam right from the fall. It's very interesting to know that poverty, taking that poverty was part of the crucifixion process. He took our poverty in that process as well. It's not just our sins and our shame and our rejection and guilt, no. He also took the limitations of our material success, that is poverty, so that we might become rich. That is very, very important to know. How to understand how he took our poverty, go with me to how God defines poverty in the Old Testament. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter 28, we read verse 47 and 48. So God was warning the people of Israel who were a model of how God was going to walk with humanity. But in that example, he told them expressly the consequences of not aligning themselves with his purposes and his will. And this is what he says. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Therefore thou shalt serve thy enemies which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger, in thirst, and in nakedness, and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he had destroyed you. There is no better definition of poverty than what is described here. You say first your enemies. Poverty is not our friend, it's our enemy. There's, it is the devil that deprives us of our abundance by keeping us in ignorance, keeping us in doing the things that will bring blessing in our lives. But the key thing here is that he said he sent against them hunger, thirst, nakedness, in want of all things. Thirst, hunger, nakedness, and in want of all things. If that doesn't define poverty, I don't know what does. But it says, they are to serve the Lord their God in gladness for the abundance of all things. That is a contrast. Serving the Lord with gladness in the abund for the abundance of all things. But if you don't do that, you serve your enemies in hunger, in thirst, in poverty. That is in lack of all things. So that is what it is. Let us look at how Jesus exhausted the poverty case on our behalf. The Bible says that when they got him, the last meal he ever took was the Passover meal. 
So from that time all the way till the time he died, he ate nothing. He had no food. He had no food for more than 24 hours. He wasn't fasting, but he had no food to eat. That is hunger. And in John 19, 28, we are told that when he hung up there, he cried, I thirst. I thirst. And he gave him vinegar and he didn't drink. But most importantly, they crucified him naked. See, so in hunger, in thirst, okay, in hunger, in thirst, okay, that is very, very important. And in nakedness, in hunger, thirst, and nakedness, and in, in want of all things, lack of all things. So as he hung there naked, as he cried, he was thirsty, and as he ate nothing, he was exhausting the poverty curse that was due us because of rebellion and sin that our forebears had brought upon humanity. And imagine this, when he eventually died, he didn't even have embalming. He wasn't embalmed, because we learned that the couple of days Mary Magdalene and some others took the front, the, the, the oils and things to go and embalm him. That is lack of all things. And then we saw that even the barrier shroud that they wrapped him in was not even his. It was Joseph's who brought it and wrapped him in it. And the tomb that he was laid in was not even his. It was Joseph's. So he, he lacked everything. Jesus exhausted the poverty curse. That is when he became poor. Not when he was walking around healing the sick, casting out devils. That time they had everything to fulfill the will of God and do the things that God has sent. And the people around him also had enough to take care of their needs. But on the cross of Calvary, Jesus exhausted the poverty curse. In nakedness, in hunger, in thirst, in lack of all things. So if he did this, what should our attitude be? Okay. What should our attitude be? If you go with me to Luke chapter 23. So let's go quickly go to Luke chapter 23. So Jesus had to exhaust the poverty curse so that you and I can have abundance. And God is willing to do this. The king of glory who owns everything allowed himself to want all things so that we can have everything. In verse 50, so that's recounting what Joseph of Arimathea did. In verse 50, now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man. He had not consented to their decision and deed. He was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in the tomb which was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever lain. So he did all of this for Jesus. A borrowed tomb, borrowed burial shrouds. He totally exhausted the poverty curse for us. So what should our attitude be in all of this? What should we do as believers to be able to take advantage of all this? In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, the Bible says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. So this is the purpose of God. God is able to make all grace abound toward you. But so far as we don't visualize it that way, we think that, well, I come from a background that maybe we don't have any resource. I have no ancestral or family ties to wealth. So I, I'm going to be where I am. My children's children will be where they are. God never said, 
you having abundance is tied to ancestral wealth. Rather, it's tied to Christ. Why am I saying this? Well, we need people to help us. We need people to counsel us and to guide us and all. But the ultimate source of our supply is grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor. Because what God will make to abound for you is his grace. And where is that grace? It was bought for us in Jesus Christ. So since God is able to make all grace abound toward you, not some grace, but all grace abound towards you, that you will always have all sufficiency in all things, not in some things. And note the words carefully. All grace, always having all sufficiency, all things, and then abound abundance. I don't know how much more emphasis God can lay on the fact that Jesus had broken the poverty curse of us in nakedness, in hunger, in thirst, in lack of all things. In Christ Jesus, when he hung there naked, when he ate no food, when he took no water and he, he was thirsty and he laid in those burrow, in that borrowed tomb, and God wrapped in the, a burial shroud that didn't even belong to him or his family. God was exhausting the poverty case. So now you don't have to focus just on you as a person. Also think about what Jesus did. Grace is a merited favor. Grace is what lifts you up when you've come to the end of the road. It is not just your academic qualification. It is not just your name, your family name. Real riches and abundance is in Christ Jesus. If nobody ever built wealth in your family because of 2 Corinthians 9, 8, you can. You can rewrite your history. You can rewrite your family story because of what Jesus did. So right now we know that he made all grace abound towards us. When? When Jesus died on the cross and he exhausted the poverty curse on our behalf. So begin to change your prayers. Begin to change your focus. Begin to look at life in a different angle. Because God wants you to prosper. He wants you to have all sufficiency. It is not what your theology is saying. It is what God is saying. Poverty is not holiness. They are two different things. And God will not let Jesus die and go through all this and say that, oh, it, this doesn't matter. When you are poor, then I'm really happy. No. God wants us to have abundance. There are ways he wants you to do it. If we do it his way, it is going to bear fruit the way God wants. But that is a subject for the next series that I'll be talking about. About what success is in God. But right now, this is the foundation. Through Jesus' sacrifice, all grace abound towards me. All grace abound towards you. And you are supposed to have all sufficiency in all things. And to able to have abundance to do good work in his kingdom. I will again, you know, we, we are told that it is he who gives us the power to make wealth. Strom 8, 18. He gives us the power to, make, to establish his covenants in the earth. So God's desire is not to keep us where Adam left us because Jesus dealt with the sin and everything that Adam brought upon humanity. So we are entitled to the blessings. Having said that, in closing this, I want to draw your attention to something very odd. Few other crucial things that Jesus did for us that you need to know. He took our curses. Curses are things that stand in our way. It may come from generational from our families or things that we have done or whatever. But just like we see how God pronounced curse on Adam and all, curses are real. But the good news is that whether it's our own doing or ancestral, you know, covenants that are made in our name or other things that has unleashed a curse upon us. And curses place a ceiling or barriers over our lives and 
prevent us from enjoying what we just heard that Jesus did for us. But the good news is that Jesus became a curse so that we might have the blessing. And blessing, I would rather want to walk in a blessing than under a curse. So if you look at your life for any reason and it feels like you are just spinning your wheels and it's just a pattern of poverty from generation to generation, sicknesses from generation to generation, inexplicable things. Remember, there is blessing over your life because of Jesus Christ. The whole subject of curses and blessings has been well dealt with in a very elegantly by the late Bible teacher Derek Prince. Now, I recommend his materials that is from curses to blessings. It's very good material. But I'm just going to highlight the fact that the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23, that cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And in the Hebrew, the cross and the tree just are interchangeable, are used interchangeably. So in this context, Jesus, by hanging, being crucified on the tree or on the cross, became a curse. And with that, he broke the yoke of curses. When Paul was explaining this in Galatians chapter 30, he limited it to the curse of the law because they were supposed to follow the law. If they didn't, they would, it brought a curse. Jesus fulfilled that requirement. But beyond that, the crown of thorns they pressed on his head because as we read in Genesis chapter 3, God said, thorns and thistles the earth is going to bring. For the fact that this poor even imagine that they could make a crown of thorns and press on his head is very telling. But Jesus took away the curses. Even if it's thorns and thistles or whatever they are, he became a curse for us. And why did he become a curse? So that we can become the blessing. The other thing he did that we read in Isaiah chapter 53 was that Jesus took our sicknesses. A lot of people may say that, oh, sicknesses humbles me. Well, God says, humble yourself. God doesn't need sicknesses to humble you. If anything at all, I told in 3 John chapter 2, that beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper. What is prosperity to be successful? And to walk in health. That's a prayer the apostle prayed for his friend. And I believe that God answers the prayers of apostles. He wouldn't have prayed a prayer like that if God couldn't answer. So it's the will of God that we prosper. We be the ones who are blessed. We be the ones who are walking not in lack, not in poverty, but in abundance. And above all, we are the ones who are walking in health. Whatever the enemy is throwing at you, whatever sickness, it could be generational sicknesses, whatever it is, pursue health. Because the Bible says that by his stripes we were healed. Those stripes he took as they took off his robes. And we are told that in Isaiah chapter 53 and Isaiah chapter 52. That when they were done scorching him. His face, his, his whole you know, appearance was worse than any human being. He was completely torn up. He was shredded. And the Bible says that by the stripes we are healed. So there's a legal basis for you not just to be healed, but to walk in health. To walk in health. Maybe for a whole number of years, you're growing up years, you've never known health. I want you to turn to the Lord. You lift up a prayer. Tell him, Lord, by your stripes, I was healed. And like John prayed, you also pray. I want to prosper. And above us, my soul is prospering. I also want to walk in hell. For all of this that Jesus has done for us, it won't benefit us if we don't put our name on it. And how do we do it? The Bible says that with the heart, we believe unto righteousness. And with the mouth, we confess to salvation. God is offering you salvation and you don't want to enter eternity without benefiting from all of this. 
So if you never know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I will encourage you to pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, you did all of this for me. You went to the cross, took my shame, my guilt, my rejection, my sicknesses, my poverty, my rejection, so that I might have life. Today, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart, be the Lord of my life. That simple prayer translates you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And you can begin a journey of experiencing these blessings. God doesn't need these blessings in heaven. We need them here on earth. And it's for us. Thank you so much for joining me. And if you have any questions, as the episode ends, you have opportunity to see all the links by which you can get to us. And I really welcome your feedback. God willing, we'll begin a new series on prosperity and abundance. Because now that we know that Jesus done for us, we want to look at how God wants us to be successful. So join me in the next couple of episodes as we continue to search God's word and to grow. May God richly bless you. And I look forward to seeing you in another episode. Thank you. to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest.